All right, good morning. Uh, I'm Mark Lobauer, Chairman of the, the Pinelands Commission Climate uh, Committee. And I'd like to call this December meeting of the Climate Committee to order. And as our first order of business, I'd like to entertain a motion for adoption of the minutes of our last meeting of September 15th. So moved. Thank I'll you, second that. Uh, Thank you, Rick. All right, is there any discussion of the minutes? I'd like to just say they were extremely thorough yeah. and I appreciate the work that was done. Uh, on and I think account. that's important. That's important to have all that information recorded, archived. Yes, I, I agree, Chairman. All right. Okay, all in favor of the adoption of the minutes as submitted, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No, I guess, I guess that was unanimous. All <laughs> right, so the, so the minutes are adopted. Uh, before we go into the regular order of business on our agenda, I did want to make uh, one remark uh, I, I saw uh, from the uh, Pinelands Commission's uh, press release yesterday that uh, we have lost a good friend and colleague, uh, former Commissioner Jay Mounier, uh, passed away at the age of 77 last week. Uh, several uh, commissioners uh, commented in the release. Chairman Prickett, your remarks were uh, particularly uh, poignant and I appreciated them. And I, I just wanted to add, uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone uh, quite so committed uh, to the efforts of the Pinelands Commission as former Commissioner Mounier. Mm -hmm. I mean, long after he ceased serving as a commissioner, he continued to come faithfully and regularly to our meetings. Most times when he attended our meetings, he had something to say. Uh, most every time he opened his mouth to speak, he had something uh, important uh, to say mm -hmm. and to point out to us that would make us all think. And I really appreciated his participation, his involvement, his care. Um, he and I had a, a running dialogue for several years uh, behind the scenes uh, via email uh, over several issues, particularly about climate. Uh, you know, he and I had a, had a very uh, gentlemanly disagreement about climate and he challenged me. And I have to say, uh, I, I really improved my understanding of the climate issues thanks to the prodding and the questions uh, that Commissioner Mounier would pose to me. He, he forced me to really think my positions. And I'm sure he did that for all of us uh, for many issues, whether it be PDCs or you know, <laughs> agricultural land use or, or whatever it was that was near and dear to his heart at any given time, he made us think about it. And um, I, I appreciate everything he did. And I have to say he will be missed. I, I know we'll all have more to say about him at our upcoming Pinelands Commission meeting, but uh, I thought it, I, I've had my say. If any uh, of my colleagues would like to say anything about Jay, and now you're certainly welcome to. To add what you said, Mark, he, he was a dedicated protector of the Pinelands, and it didn't matter whether he was on the commission or not. He was there almost every meeting, and as you said, contributed well. So. Uh, he was a great asset to the Pines and will be, will be missed. He, he was such a very, he, he was such a very friendly person, very approachable, very willing to engage in conversation uh, with, with commissioners, I think, as well as the public. And uh, it was always a treat to talk to him because he brought so much experience to, to the conversation, uh, no matter what it was you know, we, were, we were talking about. So, uh, uh, I, I certainly, when I think of a commission meeting, one of the things I think about is Jay, you know, sitting there in the front row, usually front and, center. The front row. <laughs> and uh, I know he loved blueberries. I know he's a good friend of Paul Galetta. Uh, they came in together, uh, many of meetings and uh, hey, he's going to be missed. He is going to be missed. Well, thank you, commissioners. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, to, to Jay's family. You know, thank you so much you know, for sharing Jay with us for, for all those years. You know, we're very grateful. All right, so uh, returning to the agenda, uh, the next item is an update on the commission's application for the local government energy audit. And I'll turn uh, over to our executive director. Yeah, I thought um, he would all be interested to um, have a look at the information that we had to gather and submit as part of the application. 
So um, Jessica has got a few slides she's going to share with you. We, we have submitted the application um, and have had some good conversations with um, BPU, the BPU representatives who deal with this application process. And, um, and anyway, I, I just thought uh, in terms of the, the information we gathered on energy use and some other interesting things they ask about, it would be good for this committee to see to see that because it's it's something we've been discussing with you for a while. So Jessica's gonna show you parts of the application and the information we filled out. Oh, great. Good morning, commissioners, Good morning. staff, and Good members morning, of Jess. the public. I'm gonna provide, as I said, I'm gonna provide the follow-up regarding the energy audit. I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know when you guys can see it. Yeah, it's on. It's there. Yep. Wonderful. The first screen that you see is the beginning scope of the local government energy audit that we discussed, how we were applying for. And okay. One of the first couple pages, the whole application is actually spreadsheets that are macroed and everything like that. So the first order of information they were asking about general building information. So they asked about every building we had. So basically you have your address, they looking for what year the items were built, if there was any renovations at some point. So they were pretty impressed that a lot of our buildings are historic. And when they were looking at the dates, 1820 and 1880, they were, wow. you know, they were shocked. <laughs> and we went to the sizes, how many square feet, you know, number of floors, how many occupants. So that was the first part of it. Additionally, they want to know what when was staffed, are we open on weekends, are we a 12-month operation as opposed to a 10-month operation, how many computers, do we have cooking facilities, although we do have kitchens, we do not have um, stoves or anything like that, if we have any walk-in freezers, which we don't, <laughs> swimming pool, no, no swimming pool, we're not doing laundry, and whether the buildings are heated 100% and cooled 100%, which is yes, because, mm -hmm. you know, we have HVAC. Mm -hmm. everything. Then we go into our electric information, where that's where it starts to get interesting. RJS is on its own meter, where the Fenwick Manor, Carriage House, and Barner are on what is called a campus meter. Mm -hmm. So they're all on the same, the three buildings are on the same meter. So we provided them with the information on that. During our conversation, we realized that the numbers, they're asking for 14 months, mm -hmm. which is at the top of the screen. And we were close to the public. I mentioned to them, I'm like, well, we've been closed since COVID, which that skewed what our numbers would normally be. So then right. we came to the agreement that we were gonna provide them with 14 months prior to COVID. Okay. So, which is at the lower part of your screen. Good. So as you can see, you know, RJS, changed dramatically. So it, when we have COVID and we're fully staffed, we're at about 34 kilowatt hours, mm -hmm. as opposed to when we were closed, we were at 26, because we still have to heat the building, still have to have a little bit of light. Yeah. We're in COVID, barn and carriage, there was a slight decrease because we still had sta some staff here. So things didn't change too much between the, com the different buildings in the compound for the other three uh, combined meters. We sent them every invoice that encompasses these two durations. So they got a large quantity of scanned invoices. Mm -hmm. Additional information they asked is for the PSE&G. They asked for the PSE&G after the facts. So we're providing them with that information right now. So waiting for that. And I also had to measure the size of the parking lots. So. There were staff outside looking at me like what I was doing, walking around the parking lots, measuring the square footage of the parking lots. So um, we have submitted it. We're working with them right now. And hopefully at some point I'll have additional feedback. So. Jessica, did they give you any, any indication of how response times or how long it might be before we hear anything? No, they haven't, but I can ask them today when I'm sending them the additional okay. information. Yeah, I'm so. just curious. I, I mean, I think they do like a rolling process. I'm just curious if it's, you know, six months, six weeks. I will ask them that. Yeah. 
about my share. Does anybody have any questions? I, I'm curious about uh, the two utilities, um, you, both uh, JCPNL and PSENG. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we drawing from, from each of the two? I guess we get electricity from one and do we get gas from the other? Yes, natural gas from the other one. Uh, PSENG is natural gas, JCPNL is our electric, which we are actually on a consortium with the state for that. Okay. So we get at a, a lower or reduced cost. And um, so this was strictly about efficiency of the buildings with regard to heating and cooling. How about with regard to lighting? Uh, um, that would probably be the next step from my understanding at the meeting, the next phase. Mm -hmm. They may ask me to take pictures of the buildings or if not do a live walk around with a mm -hmm. um, like phone with the camera on so they can uh -huh. see things. So, or they may decide to come here. We don't know yet. So depending on the circumstances of what is allowable. So that may be the next step. And then- we'll So that, but that will be explored. That will yes. be- Yes. Okay. All right, good. All right, commissioners, do you have any questions for Jess? I was just curious about the parking lot square footage. Um, mm -hmm. it, why do they need to know about parking lot? I mean, I, I'm just curious. I don't have any idea why that's important. Um. I haven't asked, but I can, but I'm assuming if we were going to put solar panels in to see the size of the parking lot, if right. it was suitable uh, for solar, solar panel, panels. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's my guess too. They're looking at, you know, existing yeah. impervious surface and how much space we have. And, but I'll ask today when I reach out to her. That's not, not a priority. Yeah, if you're going to, I'd be interested. Thank you. Good question. I'm interested too. I, I would suspect that part of it is, um, you know, vehicle use is the highest contributor to, to climate change in the state and knowing how many parking spaces you have really is related obviously to how many vehicle miles traveled to get there and to get back. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's right. And uh, I, I was just going over that data last night. Uh, transportation use, particularly uh, motor vehicles uh, that are used by individuals uh, contribute 42% of the state's CO2 burden uh, so it is the largest single component. So yeah, it'd be fair to ask. And then you, you know, you can generally cannot get to the commission without using a vehicle. I, I dare say, I suspect I'm the only commissioner that's ever traveled to the, to the meeting by mass transit once. Wow. It wasn't, it wasn't what? easy. How long did it take you? I want to tell you, say I took the, took the, um, train from Philadelphia to Camden and then a bus and they, they dropped me mm -hmm. off, um, you know, I don't know, a half a mile from the commission. They couldn't get me any closer than that. But Wow. <laughs> it, it can be done, but not easily. It can not be easily. Done. Okay. Definitely an issue. Yeah. With the little things we learned over the years. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. no, that, that's real dedication to want to yeah. test that out and find out. <laughs> Pretty good, Commissioner. Lord. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I guess I didn't have a uh, an alternative that day, and um, uh -huh. John Stokes drove me to Paco to get home. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, Commissioner Lloyd, you may remember you took the light rail in once because I picked you up and drove you into. Wow, <laughs> that's okay. right. And I, I also used to take the light rail to Bordentown, and it would meet Candy and come down. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow! All right, great. Next dedication. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a shame. I mean, the connections ought to be better, but admittedly, we're a pretty remote office. You know, yeah. we are out in the pines. So, uh, all right. Is there anything uh, further on that, Sue, or should we? Uh, no, we will. We will just keep you posted. If we um, if we hear anything, or they ask us for any more interesting information, we will let you know. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And this is. It's perfect. It's right in line with a lot of the questions I was asking, uh, you know, months ago before we learned about the audit. And so this, this is asking all the right questions. I'm really glad it's helping us to try to understand how much energy do we use? How can we use less, be more efficient? And how can we use cleaner energy? I like that. Okay. So the next item on the agenda then is the update on the design and installation of our rain garden at commission offices. Yes, we're also yeah. very excited about this. Paul um, is going to talk a little bit about our recent um, work and visit from 
um, the Rutgers people who are helping us out. And so you all recall, this is something that we put into the, um, the fiscal year budget. We have um, set aside about $20,000 from the Katie Fund mm -hmm. to um, explore the possibility of siting and locating and designing and installing a rain garden that would um, sort of be, well, we'll obviously help with our stormwater management, but also, um, you know, continue the once we're open to the public and we have people back here at the office, it would be sort of an outdoor educational space to go along with the indoor space at the visitor center. Um, so that was sort of the, the idea of trying to tie all of that together. And we've had a very successful beginning to that process. So Paul's gonna share with you where we are right now. Okay, thank you very much for the intro. Uh, so as you know, with the rain garden, it's really critical that you just have someone help you to determine where there are feasible locations for it. You know, for example, you've got to have somebody who has familiarity with uh, the drainage and, and the siting as far as you don't want it too close to a building. In fact, you want it at least 10 feet from the building and you want to have it away from the drip line of trees and shrubs. And so I reached out to the Rutgers Cooperative Extension's Water Resources Program and their director enthusiastically uh, agreed to work with us and to meet with us. And so on November 22nd, uh, members of our staff, Sue, Jessica Lynch, John Keyes and I met with three representatives from Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And they toured our grounds here to assess possible sites for a rain garden. And we took a close look at options around the Richard J. Sullivan Center and the Fenwick Manor Farmstead uh, while making note of any opportunities or constraints. Um, and so following that visit, uh, the Rutgers representatives provided us with a proposed scope of work uh, for their services. And as part of the first objective in the proposal, Rutgers would complete an engineering design for the rain garden and a, they would produce a detailed site survey or, or conduct that prior to preparing a topographic base map. Uh, hyd hydrology calculations would be performed to size the rain garden. Uh, they would produce a site plan, landscape plan, provide us with detailed sheets and uh, a cost estimate and materials list would be provided as well. And for, so for that first objective, they provided a cost of $2,500 for those services. And as part of the second objective in their proposal, Rutgers would provide constructive construction oversight for the installation. And so that means one of their designers would be on site while the garden is being excavated and they would actually help with planting and mulching the garden. Uh, this objective does not include the cost for materials, plants, soil amendments, stone, piping, filter fabric, or excavation. But the cost for that second objective is 1500 So 2500 and 1500 uh, And so they just provided that to us, their proposal last week, and we're still reviewing it. But since then, Rutgers also sent us three concept plans and drawings for Rain Garden. And I'm going to screen share what that, those look like. Oh, great. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Oh, yes, there we go. Okay, so we, we had tasked them with uh, trying to keep it under a thousand square feet or a thousand square feet, uh, but we also said you could perhaps go above that. And the reason for that is we may, that might trigger the need for uh, an application uh, if we go above a thousand square feet. And that application, I believe, unless I'm wrong, would go to DEP uh, to review. We can't review our own application. Um, but anyway, so that's what this is based on. And so the first concept plan here, you'll see this is the Fenwick Manor Farmstead. Right there is the, the bog garden. Uh -huh. And we looked at this area. This is a very challenging area, as you can imagine, because th these are trees and the drip line of the trees pretty much covers most of the area. And you'd have to actually put in piping to get the downspouts to go that direction. Uh-oh, mm -hmm. I think I lost my screen here. We're good, I still see it. Okay, oh, I'm back. For a second there, I lost connection. Okay, so the, under this first concept, they would put uh, about 300 square foot of rain garden right here. Right. And then they gave us a second one that would combine plan one and plan two. Uh, and this is the Richard J. Sullivan Center. 
and uh -huh. you know here's the parking lot and there's the entrance and so the flagpole's right here and so this would go a rain garden would be placed right here right before the sidewalk area mm -hmm. and so that would be about 600 uh, square feet. So combining those two, that would get you to, to uh, a thousand square feet. The third concept plan is the one I think we, we uh, are most um, interested in because of all the potential concerns with concept plan one. Keep in mind that area is full of roots. And of course there will be, you know, some, some test pits dug to determine what's going on there. But that seems to be a, a, a really tricky place to put a rain garden, frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas this, under the concept plan two, this spot, which is incorporated over here, that's what we really, I think, are most interested in. And they would also include what's called a bioswale, which I'm hoping they're going to provide with a little more information about how that works and would connect to the detention basin here. Mm -hmm. so we just received this, I should note, these concept plans like on Wednesday before the holiday. So we want to take a closer look at these. But... Uh, I'm really excited about uh, concept plan three. And, and I think uh, what we can do is have them come back. And, and for, if we agree to the, their proposal, we enter into this agreement with Rutgers. They can provide us with uh, more information, can conduct those, uh, those tests that they talked about. And uh, you know we would need to do utility markouts and all sorts of other things. We'd probably have to hire someone to do um, some digging. Uh, you know, for any piping uh, and, and any other things we would need. But it seems very positive as far as this location here because of the terrain and the benefits for uh, access for the public that this could really be a good spot. And once we get to that point, if we enter into this agreement, we could also reach out to the native nursery. Of course, everything we're going to plant is going to be native. Um, and so uh, try to get a better sense of of costs there. But that, that's pretty much the information I have now. It seems very positive. I think uh, Rutgers is super excited to work with us. This could serve as a demonstration garden. I think there's opportunities to put in a, uh, a um, wayside panel and they've, de they've developed wayside panels that describe what a rain garden is and why it's beneficial to the environment. I think we should put one of those in too, next to this. Uh, and, and that's pretty much the information I have. Commissioners, you have any questions for Paul about this? This is this is very exciting. I mean, I can't imagine a better way to spend four thousand dollars. I guess I'm interested. You know, <laughs> it's a bargain. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It, be, it will be interesting to see what the what the uh, cost of construction is, but I right. can't imagine a better way to spend four thousand dollars than to get them to continue to work with us. Mm -hmm. They they really were wonderful. I mean, Paul has said it, but they were excited and enthusiastic and they loved the grounds and the buildings and um, we were just so impressed with the knowledge they had and their suggestions and how quickly they responded with these plans it was it's been wonderful so far so we're excited <laughs> it'll be good now it sounds like their focus at Rutgers is on the the drainage issues and uh, you know accumulation of rainfall. Are, are they going to be involved at all in the selection of uh, plantings for the garden, or yeah. is that something yeah. they will be? Okay, absolutely. So you know, with a rain garden, as it works, it's it's like different levels. Uh -huh. uh, you know, different depths and different plants need to be selected based upon their ability to be more wet during mm -hmm. other, you know, compared to other parts of the garden, which are kind of like steps that need to be a little drier as you fan out toward the edge. And so mm -hmm. no doubt that their expertise will be critical in plant selection. And, you know, we're going to obviously run everything by our science office or, or whoever we need to internally to, for plant selection, because I, I can't imagine doing anything other than native pineless plants here. And the good news is oh, yeah. there's plenty of options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just curious to see what kind of varieties uh, mm -hmm. we might have there. I can imagine this could be a really special place to to sit and enjoy the the, the plant life. In fact, that I'm wondering, Paul, do do we anticipate that this might be the sort of place where we could actually uh, build some seating around the perimeter so that employees on a lunch break could, could sit by the rain garden? Yeah. That's certainly uh, a good idea and, and a possibility. Um, you know, the entire grounds, I feel, can be an opportunity for uh, the public and 
and of course for our employees to enjoy what we have over years. Over the years, mm -hmm. as you know, we've put in, we've, we've had an emphasis on native plants. We mm -hmm. removed that grassy area in front yes. of the building and put in a pollinator garden, which absolutely gets loaded with uh, butterflies mm -hmm. uh, during the summertime. And it's all 100% native timeless plants, drought tolerant plants. And then we also put in the bog garden, of course, which is full of uh, rare uh, species and of course many pitcher plants donated from Rick Cricket and uh, everything's yeah. spreading over there in that bog garden, it's thriving. This could all be part of a, of a larger plan for people to uh, come and learn about the Pinelands and see some of these things. I have, I have plans for putting together an extended sort of scavenger hunt, informational scavenger hunt, as we have huh? on the interior of the building, where we give these worksheets to students and they have to find information buried within the exhibits. Mm -hmm. We end up learning that way and yeah. we can bring that to the outside. That sounds great. Chairman, I have, I have some questions. Go right uh, ahead, Chairman. Uh, Paul, I'm interested in uh, the location here um, of these two, two gardens in the third uh, concept plan. I think you mentioned the uh, one yeah. that's closest to the detention basin, basin is a swale. Uh-huh, bioswale. And I'm assuming that uh, the top um, rain garden would drain into the swale and that would take the water, whatever's left, into the detention basin? That's that, something okay. I want to, yeah, I can't speak authoritatively on the okay. bioswale at this point, but I, that's a question I will have for them. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, you know, why. And is it also is the idea that all of the uh, um, precipitation falling off the roof of the Sullivan Center would end up in these in these areas? They'd have to pipe it all around the building. It would have to be piped all around the building. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, I think that's something we need to ask about. Uh, I don't know that that's the case. Uh, I think this would help certainly with the drainage now. Um, yes. And, you know, there's a pretty significant slope coming off this building and the downspouts coming in this direction. Yep. This area here, why they selected it, a few reasons. It's more flat. You don't want to put it on, a, on an area that's, uh, you know, greatly pitched. You want to put it on a flatter area, the rain garden. Mm -hmm. So that was the location they had indicated. But all these questions are certainly ones we want to raise, uh, and they will take that into account in their calculations yep. for the sizing of it. Well, I think for the way it's set up now, it takes care of half the building um, and without piping the other half, because you can see, you know, the peak of the roof all the way mm -hmm. around, water's going to go, half of it's going to go towards those facilities and the other half is going to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine there must be some plan to get all the water into that, into the ring mm -hmm. garden, or a lot of it. I mean, um, another, another thought is I'd love to see like a three-dimensional um, portrayal of um, what this might look like. I, I don't know if mm -hmm. they would provide that, but I'm just trying to visualize how it would all, it would tie into the other features because there are a lot of very nice plantings on the, around the Sullivan Center of Pineland mm -hmm. plants. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah. I'd be interested in seeing some kind of a 3D representation of it. Not, maybe they're going to mm -hmm. provide that. Uh, I'm not sure, but I would be interested mm -hmm. in that. I know they're going to uh, produce drawings, uh, and, okay. and I know the area they've selected here does not uh, remove any planting. It's, it's grass, mm -hmm. and yes. so the plantings are typically around this area, and then this middle part is like grass, yeah. By the wall. and then this part has some native plants on, the, on these two spots. They would not take out any plants that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't think they would. I wasn't, yeah. yeah. And but if yes, they I did, can ask it's about the part to transplant. Um, Pine, the pine man's plant. So, but yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't, wasn't thinking that they would relocate or move any. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, thank you, Paul and Sue. That This is terrific. I, I really appreciate it. And once again, this will afford us the opportunity to lead by example, you know, demonstrate that you really can manage your stormwater uh, on your site and uh, do good things with it rather than have it cause runoff and lead to flooding. So um, yeah, this is, this is great news. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, we've had a, a suggestion of our uh, meeting dates for the upcoming year. I don't know if there's uh, anything that the director wanted to say about it or if any commissioners have any questions about them. 
Uh, well, I'll just let me just start off. Um, we are in the process, uh, Jess and I, of um, you know picking scheduling Pinelands regular Pinelands Commission meeting dates for for 2022, and the usual schedule for the PNI committee that last Friday of every month. So we have those dates set, and then we thought we would just talk briefly this morning about how you all wanted to schedule and structure the future climate committee meetings. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna suggest that we not attempt to meet every month. That mm -hmm. is, um, I think proved to be very, very difficult um, since it's the, it's the same commissioners um, basically, mm -hmm. you know, for all of these meetings. And um, it, that's a lot of time and, and effort for all of you and for the staff as well. So um, I'm thinking perhaps um, we come up with dates for um, perhaps every other month in 2022, starting in February. And we start out that way. We can always add more meetings if, if um, the need arises. Um, but that would be my suggestion. We start in February and then, um, you know, February, April, June, the middle of the month we've been using, uh, with the exception of this meeting, but we've been sort of using a, a Wednesday morning in the middle of the month as the date. Uh, but that's, so that's just something uh, to start from. That would be my mm -hmm. suggestion is that we not, uh, not try to do every month. Commissioners, what, what do you think about this? I mean, I, I, I just had to agree and understand. I wonder if we should schedule every month because it's easier to cancel than it is to to resurrect. Um, and with the with the with the intention that we would do it bi monthly. Um, I guess the other question is: is it is it feasible to do this the afternoon of a PNI committee meeting when you know, presumably we're going to all be traveling there for um, mm. again? Uh, and right. That's a good point. It makes sense to, to, to piggyback it on another. I think PNI would be the one to piggyback, piggyback on if we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, we've talked about that in the past as a possibility. Um, the issue we've been having, though, is, uh, and particularly when we start, we resume in person meetings, is those, the PNI meetings can go on for, you know, we have some pretty heavy agendas coming up and, and they can easily take us to lunchtime and then, um, you know, schedules being what they are, we, most of the commissioners have had trouble, you know, remain, you know, most of you say, well, a lot of times we'll have people say, I can only be here till 11. I'm, I'm good until 12. And that may really um, prevent us from being able to uh, you know, have both meetings on the same day. I, I, I worry a little bit about that. Um, we, we can try that. Um, we could add uh, you know, depending on what a PNI agenda looks like for a given month, we may that may help us to add some of these items. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as you know, we could, and as far as scheduling and canceling, canceling is not hard, but it does cost us money because we have to advertise when we cancel. Just has to, we have to publish notice and distribute notices, so it is a bit awkward to have to schedule and cancel. Um, mm -hmm. So something to keep in mind. Chairman Prickett, you have any thoughts on this? Uh, no, I'm just, I'm kind of listening. I, I've, you know, yeah. heard uh, these thoughts before. Um, I, I don't know, I was thinking of, uh, the only other idea I had is maybe clustering, you know, maybe meeting three, three, um, months in a row and then taking some time off. Uh, I think it's good to have follow-up. You know, you have a discussion first meeting, like the last meeting we talked about um, uh, recharging centers for cars. Yeah. And I mentioned I would do some research and I did some research and then I don't have the research at my fingertips at the moment. So my only suggestion, which really might not be viable, is maybe you know schedule two meetings and then a break, and two meetings and a break, uh, just so that you have um, some continuity between meeting to meeting. But uh, that would be the, the novel thing I would interject to this discussion. Um, for my part, uh, I can uh, understand uh, where the director is coming from. I. I agree that it might make sense to make these bi-monthly, especially since uh, from my perspective, I, th I think we're shifting into a new phase of the activity of this committee now. Uh, for the past year, we were gathering a lot of information. We were entertaining the opinions of experts who came 
uh, and to speak to us on, uh, you know, the, the climatologists speak to us. We had DEP experts talk to us about what the anticipated effects of climate uh, change are going to be on our state and on the Pinelands in particular. We had uh, dueling forestry experts speak to us about what does the issue of carbon sequestration mean uh, for, from these two different uh, points of view uh, of forestry. I, I think we've done a great job at, at trying to identify uh, climate issues that should influence our policy making in the Pinelands. And at this point, I see us moving into uh, you know, focusing our efforts on trying to draft and pass, or, or at least recommend to the full commission for passage, amendments uh, to the CMP uh, so that the CMP finally will include some language uh, that will allow us as commissioners to take climate, uh, the climate crisis into consideration and our obligation to mitigate that climate crisis. Uh, take those into consideration with regard to all of our policies, whether it be with regard to development applications, whether it be with regard to uh, our own operations or you know, whatever other business uh, that we have. I think that, that's our, our immediate uh, objective to, to try and come up with language that will serve as a guide now that we've heard what the policy issues are. And if it's going to be a lot of work, uh, and it certainly will be a lot of work to prepare a language and then for us as committee members to review that language and to decide what amendments we wanna to make to it before we recommend it to the full commission. Uh, it may make sense to do uh, bi-monthly meetings, give the staff time uh, to work uh, on this language for us. Uh, I agree that as issues come up, uh, as opportunities for discussion of other things come up, we can always call for meetings apart from, in addition to uh, the bi-monthly schedule, but at least if we if we set out a schedule that's bi-monthly, the staff will be better able to prepare uh, to give us solid agendas worth of, of business uh, to do on these meetings rather than scrambling every month uh, to try to have materials ready for us uh, to consider. So, so that I, I, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I love Commissioner Loy's suggestion of trying to piggyback our meetings on the days of the meetings of the p &I committee. Uh, I mean, uh, Susan, I absolutely uh, recognize your concern uh, that you, you've voiced about that, that maybe it becomes difficult to get a quorum uh, because people tend to bail out the longer a day that uh, we have here. They can't, they can't last that long. But um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's, it's pragmatic for us to consider uh, we are all going to be returning to the commission offices for these meetings. It makes sense to try and minimize, for, for the commissioners, it makes sense to minimize the number of trips uh, that we make to see if we can't aggregate these things uh, on single days where possible. Uh, so we're talking about, if we do bi-monthly meetings, we're talking about six days out of the year ahead where we would have both a P&I meeting and a climate committee meeting. And, you know, hopefully with enough advance notice and planning, commissioners can work around that and, and agree to do it. I, I, for one, would prefer to do that okay. uh, rather than uh, coming on, on separate days. Okay. So. Yeah, no, I think um, you made a good point about minimizing travel and, um, and we have we have to we're planning now and trying to figure out you know ways once we're once we're back having meetings in person having some kind of hybrid opportunity so the commissioners will still be able to participate remotely if necessary so that may help as well on days when perhaps traveling here and remaining here all day might not work we're yes. hoping they'll be able to provide the this zoom opportunity as well and do both um we're working on that okay. um, logistics of that so that could help as well so okay um I like the idea of combining and, and it, it will be in some respects easier for the staff then to plan for meetings and packets and agendas and advertising and all of that if we do them on the same day. So, um, okay. I mean, I'm gonna suggest that we start the first of these dual meetings at the end of February then. That's the, okay. um, that would be the first of the, the, 
two meetings in one Friday, if you like. So I forget what that date is, but um, okay. end of February, end of April, end of June. Um, and we start with that. Uh, all just because I know that trying to do trying to do the two meetings at the end of January is going to be difficult. We have a, a big agenda for the PNI meeting. I think I've mentioned that before, and um, and I think it limited opportunities to get ready for two meetings between now and January, given the holidays and yes, the backlog of vacation days that most of the staff have that I'm trying to get them to take between now and, and January. So, um, okay. <laughs> uh, so. We could do that starting in February and uh, and and see how that goes. Yeah. Okay. Um, com commissioners, any other comments on on that? You, you want to now that we've had a chance to think about it and kick it around? No. I'm good. But we're talking about every other meeting, every other. Yeah. Meeting. So, yeah. So February, April, June, August, October, and December for what, the dates that we have a P and I meeting in those months we would also have a climate commission. Meeting. Right, so probably not December. Yeah. We typically don't have a December p &I meeting, but um, oh, okay. as we get closer to that, um, you know, next year and we get closer to the end of 2022, we can, if we need to- you figure out when to have it. Yeah, maybe, maybe November. Okay, all right. And then we'd always have the option to call for a, a special mm -hmm. meeting if, if we wanted one to address an issue uh, or if any one of the committee members uh, wanted to do it. Wow. And honestly, too, I mean, um, you know, in, in a month where you have a P&I meeting, but not a climate meeting scheduled, it is the same group of commissioners. So yes. if there is an item that you want to put on that you could put on the P&I agenda for that month and, and, you know, obviously could be discussed. At well, that that's true. Person. Very true. Yeah. That would work. Okay. All right. Just a further reflection. If, we, if we're going to schedule six meetings and we're losing December, that's five. And if we're in August, there's a danger of that being canceled. I wonder if we should, um, I don't have a problem starting in February, but I wonder if we, then we should do March, then by monthly after and that. So that we hit, I think we hit better months if we do that. And perhaps okay. we're likely to have the, uh, to be able to have the meetings. Okay. W would you look into that, Executive Absolutely. Director? Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds good to me. Ed, you're concerned with August is just that it's, it, it, it's often a lot vacation of people missing. Time, you know it's it's so i think sometimes it's a tough month to get folks together maybe i'm wrong um you know i, I just you know if, if p and i were canceled in august for instance you know would we then go with a climate meeting okay that would give us february march may july september november okay so yep okay that would give us the six yeah. okay Thank you for the suggestions, Ed. Appreciate it. Those are good. Okay. Uh, unless there's anything anyone would like to say further about that scheduling, I suppose we move uh, to our last item of business before uh, our public comment section, and that is discussion of possible amendments to the CMP. Uh, I, I clearly want to invite everyone, not, not just my fellow committee members, but members of the public, if they have suggestions for us of the things that we could do uh, to amend and improve the CMP so that we're addressing climate mitigation issues, I, I welcome and entertain uh, you know, those ideas. I, I brought a few uh, to the table today for our discussion so we could uh, get this started, um, but these are by no means intended to be exclusive on my part. I, I want us, and in fact, I also view these as just a way for us to get started on this. I see this as an ongoing process that as we learn more uh, about climate issues, as we learn more about uh, the technology uh, to respond to climate issues, as we learn more about uh, you know, development possibilities and uh, improvements to development in the state uh, that perhaps we may want to further tighten, but this would at least set uh, some preliminary language that would allow the Pinelands Commission to take climate into consideration in the business that it conducts. So um, I hope you've all seen these. I had uh, sent an email uh, to Director Grogan uh, suggesting three areas. The first one, which I, th I think is probably the most important one and, and possibly the easiest one, 
for us to do. It suggests that we have a, uh, a phrase in the CMP that would say something to the effect, and I'm not suggesting the language, just, just the substance, uh, that the CMP would be consistent uh, with the goals of the New Jersey Global Warming Response Act. I, I suggest this because it allows us to, to say and do something in the CMP without having to reinvent the wheel. And the state of New Jersey already has a law in the books, New Jersey Global Warming Response Act. It was adopted back in 2007. But in reality, the, the, uh, the lion's share of the work in terms of describing and setting goals uh, for the years ahead up until 2050 uh, has been done um, over the last two years uh, by the Murphy administration. And I would like to see us embrace those goals uh, within the CMP so that we can refer to them and let them inform our decision making uh, on the Pinelands Commission. Um, there was a study uh, or a report rather that the, the Murphy administration did uh, called 8450. And that title refers to uh, the primary goal of this act, which is to reduce uh, by 80% what our uh, carbon dioxide emissions are uh, in the state of New Jersey by the year 2050. And in order to achieve that goal, it identifies three major areas of concern. Uh, the uh, transportation uh, uh, area in New Jersey, cars and trucks, buses, uh, diesel trains. Uh, then it talks about uh, home and business heating and lighting, how to be more efficient there, the very sorts of issues that we were talking about earlier today in our energy audit application. And then finally, the area of electric power generation in New Jersey. And you might ask, you know, well, is this really a fit subject for us to consider for inclusion in the CMP in the Pinelands? And I would argue that it is because the main thrust of the uh, Global Warming Response Act is to say that by 2050, we need to shift away from fossil fuel uh, burning sources of generating electricity and move into renewables. Um, renewables are already a major subject of discussion here at the Pinelands, particularly with regard to the siting of uh, solar installations, uh, but also wind. So um, that, that 80 for 50 report has a lot of specific goals that I think if we would incorporate them by reference into the CMP, we could do a great, uh, you know, make a great effort in terms of providing guidance to, the, to our fellow Pinelands commissioners on what policy making we should be doing that is consistent with that. And it's already law. It's already something that's been accepted by the governor, uh, you know, passed by the legislature. Language is already in place. We don't need to debate about whether that uh, level or this standard would be appropriate. It's, it's already a matter of law. So, so that would be my first recommendation. And as I say, I, I think it's something that we could do relatively quickly in terms of having the staff draft language that would do that and you know incorporate it by reference into the CMP. Uh, and then it would be for the Pinelands Commission in future actions to interpret, okay, how do we apply that to the things that we're doing uh, day to day? So um, anyway, I I'm talking far too much. So let, me, let me open this up for uh, discussion and, and see what you all feel. Commissioner Lloyd, do you have any Thoughts about that? Does that make sense as a first dab, or would you rather see us do our own language? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Um, okay. I, I think it makes sense to do those goals as a first step. I, I think, um, Mark, I hope it would be easy and, and, and quick to do. I think the devil's in the details. I mean, I think we need to get the goals in there, but your second and third suggestions are um, is where, where the rubber hits the road. Uh, and so, so I think yes. adopting the goals that are established by the legislature already is a, is a great idea. 
Um, but but it's the it's going to be the implementation and the application of those goals that are going to be critical because I think put it, I mean we should put the goals in, but I don't know that we can then use the goals in our decision making process without further uh, CMP amendments, which as I said I, I think is where the the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. If I if I could just chime in a minute because I agree sure. with Commissioner Lloyd, um, goals are normally reflected within the pylon, within the statute itself. So within the Pylons Protection Act, regulatory language is intended to implement and interpret that statutory mandate. Mm -hmm. So although we would have the goals, I don't think that provides the regulatory nexus that you're looking for, uh, Commissioner Lobauer. Mm -hmm. I think we need to identify specifically how we're going to regulate to achieve those goals. That's what belongs in the CMP. And that then tells the regulated community how to conform its behavior in order to um, meet and, and those objectives. So um, while I think the, the goals are good goals, I'm not sure that it's going to be effective to just incorporate those goals I agree with Commissioner Lloyd. I think we really sort of need to get to the detail of how are we going to incorporate those goals? So the goals are the policy. The mm -hmm. rules are implementation of that policy. Yeah, uh, an excellent point. And um, I, I, I certainly don't disagree. I guess I was casting about for an easy way for us to do something mm -hmm. quickly. And um, uh, I, I probably shouldn't... Uh, uh, oversimplify this. Well, tab. you know, you know what, Mark. I think there is a way to do something quickly. It's not rulemaking, which, as you've all heard me say, ad nauseum, is not quick and easy. But I think there is a way to do. You know, the commission could adopt a resolution saying these are the goals. Mm -hmm. We this is our policy. This is we we support these goals. This policy. This is how we want to proceed. You know, and and that to me is also number three on your list, which is looking at our own, you know, we did a little bit of this with the, the initial climate change, climate committee resolution. So this would sort of be building on that. You know, yeah. these are the goals that we're gonna move forward with rules to implement in our own and our own house. You know, these are the things we want to look at on, you know, to make sure our own operations are being conducted appropriately. And to me, those are things that belong in a, in a guiding resolution from the commission mm -hmm. that would establish, you know, a path going forward to come up with the rules Stacy's talking about, you know, that Ernie can use when he when he reviews public development applications and um, that we can use when we review municipal master plans and ordinances. We need standards that we can apply to development and to, mm -hmm. to ordinances. We can't, having goals, I think is great for the commission to establish, absolutely. The CMP itself needs to have very specific Standards for solar, for example, for wind, for whatever it is, tree clearing, you know, what, whatever the standards you, you come up with, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's what we need to put into the, the rules themselves. But I think having the, the guidance, the resolution, the references to, um, you know, the act that you mentioned, that could be done now. Um, and, and then that would, I think, make the path clearer that this is what we're working towards in terms of rulemaking as well. I like that suggestion uh, about doing the resolution because uh, mm -hmm. honestly, I, 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 I lay these out in terms of in, in increasingly more difficult degrees of uh, uh, acceptance at, at the commission. I was thinking, um, I thought it would be very, very simple and easy for the commissioners to say, okay, something that's already New Jersey law, Sure, we, we can agree that we'll, uh, we will follow it. We, we will share those goals. Uh, as far as uh, creating very specific uh, regulatory standards, which of course that is our job. We should be setting the standards. Uh, I saw that as taking more time and requiring a lot more uh, debate and dialogue uh, among commissioners to decide, okay, where do we set the bar uh, for, these, for these various things? Um, so, um, your suggestion that we think about a resolution that the full commission could pass with regard to the Global Warming Response Act uh, really would satisfy my concern that, gosh, I'd, I would love to see this committee recommend an action that the commission could take relatively quickly so that we make it clear 
that we're not just talking about climate anymore. We are making it a part of our decision-making process. Uh, but then take the time uh, to, to get the regulatory steps uh, carefully done properly in a way that we can, uh, or a majority of us can all agree to do. So, so that sounds good to me. Uh, I'd like to uh, just add to this. Um, so we do a resolution, which I think is a good idea. I like that idea, but what's gonna to happen to that resolution? I think staff will have it available. They'll know it's there and, and refer to it, but commissioners won't, won't always be able to do that, especially if you have new commissioners and after you know, time they haven't voted on the resolution. Mm -hmm. um, I would just suggest that maybe we have another document. You know, we have the Pioneers Protection Act, we have the CMP, uh, we have ethics, um, a booklet, um, maybe we should have a policy booklet related to applications and land use. Um, in that booklet, you know, this resolution and perhaps other policy would be included so that when commissioners evaluate applications or consider um, CMP amendments, um, they could refer to this policy book to see if everybody's on track. Let's see. Chairman see Prickett. Yes. Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but Unfortunately, um, while I think a policy booklet is a good idea in order for people to understand the um, goals of what the commission is trying to achieve, it is not a regulatory document and it can't be mm -hmm. used that way. So you cannot refer to a policy booklet or Ernie can't refer to a policy booklet and say, you know, you have to conform your development to these policies. Um, in, on, in, under the Administrative Procedures Act in New Jersey, that requires rulemaking. So if we're going to um, expect the regulated community to conform to these requirements, we have to do rulemaking. And so I just wanted to, to, with a note of caution, I think a policy booklet is great so that folks understand the commission is very serious in terms of climate change. It's working on these objectives. Um, but again, I wanna caution, it's not a regulatory document. Well, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on this. I really wasn't, it wasn't, a regulatory document it wasn't really meant, in my view, for um, the public regulatory community. It was really just meant for other commissioners. You know, they're on the commission, they can refer um, to these things when they're <laughs> give them a little more insight into making decisions on applications. All right, yeah, you know, Rick, that, that is something that long ago um, we used to do more of when new commissioners came or new staff for that matter, or new governor's authorities, unit representatives. We, it's a good idea. It's a notebook of, you know, right. not just policies, but procedures. And here are how applications are reviewed. Here are the, here's the act, here are the goals here. And this could be, there would be a number of these sort of policy oriented mm -hmm. resolutions and documents that we could put in there. Uh, it's like, almost like an orientation and refresher manual. Um, we do a little bit of that every year with the municipal officials. And I could see how this would, this would fit into that. This would be a great resolution and discussion for the next municipal council orientation next next summer. You know, to talk about these goals and these policies and the rules the commission's pursuing related to climate change. Um, but yes, I mean, I, you know, without I think we could do that without having to create a lot of new documents. Actually, I think we have a lot of that information. It's just compiling it and and being ready for when new commissioners come and, and doing that kind of orientation with them and, and they have materials to refer to. I think that's a great, it's a great idea. And for the new staff we're hiring too. I mean, that's- All right. They're all gonna need that as well. Um, so I, like I don't need to add a whole bunch of work to staff. I mean, we could do this one step at a time, this first oh, resolution, yes. put it oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking from my selfish perspective, I'd like to have these things at my finger. Oh, fit. sure. Yeah. To refer to. Right. And I think we could, we had talked at one point about creating a, a special page on the commission's website relating to climate change, you know, that would have wow. all of these, the many presentations that you all have had at this committee and um, links to various information and, you know, the initial resolution for this committee and this new one we're talking about. It could, it could be a real focal point that people could go and look to for all of this information. They could easily see the goals that the commission is, is established and, and the path we're going to follow to get there. So I think there are, there are a number of ways to keep this information sort of in the front of people's minds. And um, the website's one way of doing that, as well as, you know, the materials for, for the commission members themselves. But this would be more for the public so that 
they would have that information available as well. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> I like it. Um, may, may I suggest, Chairman Prickett, that maybe uh, we could uh, at, at some point, you know, ask the staff to show us some language that they would like to put into the existing mm -hmm. uh, policy document. Uh, maybe we're just talking about adding a paragraph uh, somewhere to an existing document that says, and you know, the commission has made it clear that uh, climate guides their decision-making, you know, something to that effect that, that we could look at at this committee. Um, if, if I could, I'd, I'd like to uh, see how specific we could get about a direction for these three uh, suggested amendments or amendment subjects. They're certainly not amendments. These, these are not written as amendments. Um, if, if the three of us would agree with the director's suggestion that a resolution would be appropriate, I mean, I, I agree. I, I, it, it sounds like uh, my colleagues agree. Uh, could we get an idea about how that might play out? What would it take for us to for, for staff to draft such a resolution, what kind of timetable would you think might be practical to bring that uh, to the commission? Should it come back to the climate committee first <laughs> for us to recommend? I mean, ideally I would love for something to happen as quickly as possible so that we could say, look, th th this, is, this is where we're going. This is the direction we're going in and we're, we're taking a firm step. And if we could do that with, as, as few interim steps as possible, I would love that, but I, I, I'd like to hear what you, what you recommend and what my colleagues think about that. With respect to the resolution, I, I think that is absolutely the way we should go. Um, we, Sue, you're right. The, if, if, we're, if we say the word amend CMP, we, we're embarking on a year long project, yeah. I think that a resolution, hopefully we can get done much more quickly. And frankly, would, would accomplish the same goals because putting a resolution together, um, frankly, uh, from a regulatory perspective, takes us no further than putting the goals in the CMP. So I think we should start with a, with a resolution. I think that's a great idea. We should post it, I think, on the, on the website to address Commissioner Prickett's concerns to, to educate you know, new commissioners, new staff members, but also the public. Um, mm -hmm. And then, to, then in thinking, you know, maybe it's, it's getting too far out, out in front of us, but let me just throw it out here. When we adopt the first substantive uh, amendment, the, the, the climate CMP amendment, uh, I would say at that point, let's put the goals in the CMP. It's, it's not duplicating another process. It's, it's, it's piggybacking on, but it was presumably with the set of goals we already agreed to, and then we could codify those in the CMP, but I think the resolution as a starting point makes a world of sense. I agree, I agree, Ed and Mark. Um, so we're, we're in agreement, I believe. All right, great, thank you. Um, um, can, can I ask a quick question, ahead. which is, so for the resolution, um, I mean, we have obviously the, the three points, Mark, that you had sort of outlined. Um, and I'm wondering with respect to number two, which is, um, yeah you know, requiring applications to address climate impacts. How, how specific you would like, I think we should think about how, how specific you want the resolution to be. Might be a no, good idea for it to include, you know, not actual standards or regulatory language, but, but topics yeah. that the commission's gonna investigate. You, know, you mentioned solar and wind, and yeah. I'm sure there are others. And some of them were on the list of possible CMP amendments that the PNI committee has been discussing. So I'm thinking some of that might belong in a resolution to sort of, so it's not just very, very general, but it oh, begins I see. Okay. to get a little more specific I, I, about. I, I thought what we were saying was do a resolution strictly with regard. I think my, maybe my signal got uh, weak or something. Your, your audio broke up for me just there. We, I, we can hear you. I can oh, okay, it. good. It, yeah, I'm getting a sign saying my internet connection is unstable. Sorry. About uh -oh. that. Um, yeah. Uh oh, yeah, I may disappear. <laughs> um, you know, all I was saying was um, that I thought the resolution would be with regard to item one only, the New Jersey Global Warming Response Act, that I envision points two and three as being very specific. 
uh, regulatory language that we would pose as amendments to the CA, and we would need to take time to do that. And how far we could go with those, I think, would be a matter of debate <laughs> among okay. the committee members and, and, I, and then among the commission. Yeah. I think um, I was thinking the resolution would clearly address the goals in, in your number one and also uh -huh. number three, because that specifically relates to the commission's own operations. Mm -hmm. facilities. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to it if, if the if my fellow commissioners were agreeable. I mean, as I said, I, I didn't want to throw a lot of uh, controversial things into one uh, vote right. that, that might make it difficult for the majority to agree. I mean, I, I can imagine that some commissioners might read this and say, you're going too far with that. Well, uh, I, I think if the resolution speaks about the goals of the Global Warming Response Act, clearly, and um, the need to, uh -huh. you know, incorporate that at some point in the CMP with specific standards attached. I think that's okay. a great thing for the resolution to do. I also think your number okay. three about the commission's own operations belongs mm -hmm. in a resolution. Those to me are not, you know, requiring a commission mm -hmm. to identify ways at its own offices to reduce emissions. To me, that does not belong in the CMP, which is the CMP is standards for development. This would be something more that I think is more appropriate yeah. for a guiding resolution that in all of our operations, the staff's directed to evaluate the following things. And it, uh, that to me clearly belongs in this resolution. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just okay. wondering more about number two, which is where more specific standards for development come into play and whether mm -hmm. we have an interest in having the resolution at least mention possible um, subjects. I, I certainly would not be opposed to it. Uh, okay. I mean, this, this is the direction I'd like to go. Uh, it, if a majority would agree with me, then fine. That'd be great. Mark, um, I agree with I Sue in terms maybe, Whoops. I'm sorry, go you go first. I, I think my perception is maybe um, commissioners and, and the public have um, uh, changed their attitudes a little bit towards um, climate change uh, over the last year or two. Um, so I'm a little more optimistic that, you know, we would get the support of the full commission on a resolution that included one and three. Um, I would think that maybe if we had that resolution for review, either at the climate committee or at the PNI committee, we could get a better idea that it would, it could fly. And then if it wouldn't, then we could separate it. But I'm somewhat confident that a resolution like that would pass the full commission, just from my perspective. So I would encourage us to move forward in, the, in, in putting a resolution together um, to put on the agenda maybe sometime in February or, or yeah, I would say February at this point or maybe January. So. The only thing that I was going to add um, was that the commission has always directed its staff through resolution if it's something significant and there are particular points that the commission wants to see. So certainly number three, with regard to our own operations, I agree with Sue. Um, the best way to handle that would also be through the resolution and um, just wanted to, okay. to throw that out there. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. Yeah, I, I can see that now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. As far as number two, I'd like to see some, some language or some ideas, you know, um, this is pretty general. Um, development should address climate impact in terms of gas emissions and proposed development. I'd, I'd like to see some specific language that we would uh, be considering. Well, what, what if the language of the resolution, Chairman, were to direct the staff to draft such right. language? In, yes, in, in, exactly. In this area? that's fine. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I think I think I have enough to sort of get started and and we can aim for February. I think that's a good goal because honestly, I don't I'm not sure that we have the ability right now to do it any quicker. I, I know, Mark, you, right. you'd, I'm sure I was waiting for you to say next Friday. We have a <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you read my mind. <laughs> so, um, you know, we will we will get started on that. There's nothing that prevents us from sharing a draft with all of you. You don't need to have a formal meeting to, you know, take a look at, at drafts as we move along. So okay. um, we can go about it that way. And then if there is a need to discuss it at a at a formal committee meeting, you know, we can we can do that at P and I at the end yeah. of January. We can do it at our combined meeting in February. We have some opportunities there. So yeah. 
I, I agree that the that the okay. resolution well, can include aspects of one, two, and three. I mean, the resolution is not regulatory, and I think it's and I, I think it's yeah. good to say. Um, but to get it done, the big part will be the next step to get it regular, get an amendment to the CMP. Um, but putting as much in this resolution as we can, and I and I think our colleagues will support it. I don't think this will be controversial. It'll be controversial when we talk about regulatory standards, but let's yes. get a resolution in place that everybody um, uh, agrees to, and that mm -hmm. that should make hopefully the CMP amendments a little easier. Good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, 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 thank you for that. I, I appreciate this guidance. And uh, yeah, I think we've come up with a good direction for this. Uh, you know, thank you all for that. Um, now, with this discussion still open, did, did anyone else have any other suggestions that they wanted to bring to the floor for amendment discussion at this time? I, I think we should continue to work on this, um, on, yeah. on amendment, um, maybe in, in, you know, more focused, in a more focused way. And have mm -hmm. some kind of a dialogue. Perhaps we can do that um, um, through emails um, before uh, the next meeting, so that mm -hmm. you know a number of us can work together to get some ideas on what we might put forward to the full committee. Um, but uh, so that would be my suggestion. I think we need to be more focused on this okay. in this direction to come up with um, right. taking maybe taking a look at the documents yeah. that you've um, put before the committee. And also looking through the CMP to see if um, we can develop some um, in that, that, that would need to be tweaked, perhaps, parts of the CMP. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. With respect to, to expanding number two, I mean, some, one thing that I want, I would like us to think about is uh, some regulation about the, um, the, the felling of trees in, in a development application. Yeah. And I would want, you know, to require at a minimum um, a, a, a significant alternative analysis that demonstrates that you've got to cut fell trees to do your proposal. Um, that's, you know, again, that's, that's going to be for a CMP amendment. I think it, again, it could be a goal in the resolution as well, but beginning in beginning to sort of flesh out what needs to go under number two. Um, I just think we should think about, um, you know, applications that, um, that call for a clearing of trees and when that's appropriate and when it may not be appropriate. And the burden, I mean, there should be a high standard in my view uh, before mm -hmm. we uh, um, have an applicant to uh, fell trees. We, you know, Commissioner, on that score, uh, uh, two or three months back, uh, Director Horner uh, produced a, a document with regard to uh, forestry standards on uh, uh, state lands. Uh, I, I think it was, I think that was the subject matter, where he had seven uh, goals uh, that we should uh, pursue, pro-forestation uh, being the first goal. Uh, and as soon as he produced that, I thought, wow, this is something that we should look into as a potential amendment uh, to the CMP at the climate committee. I actually, until you just mentioned that, it, it dawns on me, I should have included that as one of these items for us to consider because uh, I thought that was very strong uh, language that, that uh, deals directly with this question of carbon sequestration. So, um, yeah, that point well taken, I had forgotten about them too. I mean, I think some of those goals could be incorporated in the resolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I could offer, um, many of you sure. know that there is a, um, with regard to governmental development, um, municipal, et cetera, there is a no net loss act with regard to trees. And um, it may be something that could be looked at as a, as for guidance with regard to private development. Okay. That Basically, sounds... I'd, love to, I'd love to see that. I didn't know that that was out there. Mm-hmm. If you could share. It's it. been out there for, for a long time in terms of if you knock down trees, um, for a, um, a governmental project, you have to replace them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how DEP is implementing it these days. It's been a long time since I've dealt with it, but I'll okay. be happy to provide citations if anyone needs them. Yeah, please do. Thank you. That, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, did, did staff have any suggestions that they wanted to add to this discussion for uh, other areas of amendment to the CMP that might be fitting for the Climate Committee to consider at this time?
If not, we can stop this discussion, I guess. All right, well, thank you. Thank you all for this discussion. And uh, I, I think we're on a good direction now for our, some language to look at at the next meeting. All right, at this point then, I'd like to open up the meeting uh, to public comment. So Paul, if you could post, thank you. He read my mind. <laughs> and uh, we would certainly love to hear from the public. Uh, they, there may be some folks out there that would like to suggest some things to us as potential amendments to the CMP. So, while we're waiting for callers, if uh, any commissioners have anything else they wanted to uh, say to add to for the good and the order of the committee business, you're certainly welcome to do so now. I actually have one piece of very good news. To oh, report, great, go ahead. <laughs> which is that um, we will be sending out the packets today for the December 10th commission meeting. And on the agenda, you will see um, adoption of our proposed stormwater management rules. Oh, terrific. So we have gotten a go ahead from, from the governor's office, thanks to Rudy and our friends at the Department of Transportation to move forward with adoption. So wow. all of that will be going out today and um, Please plan to attend the meeting next Friday. So Absolutely. That we get those amendments adopted. That, that that went through pretty quickly, I think. Huh? That there the, the review at the governor's office and it seems to me. So that that's good. That's great. Okay, we have two callers. All right, thank you, Paul. Okay, go, I'll go let ahead. one in now. Good morning, caller. Can you please state your name for the record? Good morning. This is Ryan Greck from Pinelands Preservation Alliance. Good morning, Ryan. How are you? Go right ahead. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to comment today. Um, I just heard before, because of the delay on my computer, I, I believe I heard um, Acting Director Garogan talk about the uh, stormwater amendments being on the commission uh, agenda yes. for next month before I had to mute, so I'm, I'm great. that's great. Um, congratulations to the commissioners and the staff for working so hard on that. That's been a, a long process and I think the amendment is really great. So um, that's thank good you, to hear. Ryan. Yeah. Um, and then just for my comments from today, I would like to um, first regarding the schedule for the climate committee for the upcoming year. Um, I certainly understand the challenges of, um, uh, you know, putting the meeting together and, and getting the commissioners together and all of that. I would just like to offer that I believe that, um, you know, th this committee has not had a very regular schedule up until this point. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, the kind of t days of the week was was bouncing around for a little bit, and then the last couple of meetings were canceled. I do believe, in fact, I know that with a regular schedule, that there are many members of the public that would be very interested um, in participating in these meetings and and really have a lot to contribute to the conversation and ha frankly have high expectations for the commission to address climate change. And, um, and so I, I would encourage the commissioners to take that into consideration with the scheduling, not just in terms of the frequency, which, um, you know, Director Grogan's point about, you know, really heavy P and I agendas, and and you know, and the concern about having you know people stay on for an additional meeting after P and I, really just points to the fact that there's a lot to cover. At the, you know, yeah. at the commission level, there's a lot going on, and and so you know, more more meetings may be appropriate, even if it is a challenge. But I would encourage the commission to also consider. Um, you know, perhaps evening meetings or weekends, or, um, you know, somebody had mentioned a hybrid option. Um, it's very challenging for people to get to a meeting at 930 on a Friday. So, uh, so just something to think about, um, sort of as we move into 2022. Yeah. And then uh, great news about the rain garden um, that the commission's working on at, you know, there on your facility. Um, Paul mentioned briefly about keeping the size of the rain gardens to under a thousand square feet, um, because then that would trigger an amendment. And I would just like to suggest the commission uh, consider that, you know, a thousand square feet is probably too big for uh, a resident to be putting a, a rain garden you know, in their yard. So, so the application probably wouldn't be prohibitive there, but there are um, municipalities, for example, that might want to put in a rain garden on their property 
for, um, you know, to certainly help to manage stormwater, but also as a demonstration garden and for educational purposes. And sometimes that application can be prohibitive. And the CMP, uh, you know, currently rain gardens fall into kind of a funny uh, category, either development because of the excavation or or sort of landscaping if the excavation isn't that deep. Um, so I, you know, adding to the to the long list of CMP amendments to consider, um, I would recommend taking a look at rain gardens and that being something that, um, you know, I don't know what form that would take, uh, exemptions or what, but um, to to facilitate and encourage municipalities or other entities like that to um, develop rain gardens specifically for education. It's a wonderful purposes. idea. Yeah, thank you. It's great. Sure. And then finally, um, just about the, the conversation around the amendments, um, I appreciate uh, all the suggestions that were made. I certainly agree with, um, with Chairman Lobauer's recommendations in terms of incorporating the goals of the GWRA. Um, but I, I would caution to make sure that this, do, you know, incorporating these goals wouldn't encourage easing environmental environmental regulations to promote development of renewables. It, you know, the Pinelands, just in terms of air, area, surface area, is less than a quarter of New Jersey, and a huge amount of the Pinelands is forested. So yeah. the Pinelands Commission's role in emission reduction should focus on playing to your strengths, which is the strength of the Pinelands National Reserve, the forest. So yeah. in, in terms of solar, there's plenty of tree cutting and impervious surfaces being added into the pines in the form of regular residential, commercial and industrial development. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the commission wants to do your part to encourage renewables, we'd certainly encourage you to consider requiring new development to include solar, pan solar panels. Yeah. This yeah. would you know, serve multiple goals, including using impervious services that will already be built to be used for solar without clearing vegetation and would allow the commission to start tracking accessory solar structures, which are currently exempt from application and has been discussed in this committee that the commission really has no idea how many solar panels are out there, just, you know, that people have yeah. added to their homes or, or, or right. businesses. So, um, so we, we would encourage you to, um, to sort of move in that direction um, in terms of encouraging renewables. Um, but that's it for my comments. Thanks again for a great meeting today. Oh, thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate it. And uh, as to your, your last comment, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do think that that kind of specificity about requiring uh, renewable energy on new development applications uh, would make a lot more sense. And you, you heard Commissioner Lloyd's comments earlier about his sensitivity about uh, what we're doing with our forests and what can we do to make sure we're preserving uh, our forests and you know doing amendment language to emphasize that as a top priority. Um, I, I think we agree with you. But, uh, stay tuned for further discussion. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna let the second caller in. Good morning, caller. Can you please state your name for the record? Uh, good morning. My name is Fred Akers from the Grady Harbor Watershed Association. Yeah, good morning, Fred. How are you? Go right ahead. Good morning. I'm fine. I'm I'm just give, giving a quick call. I'm I'm a fan of, <laughs> of the climate committee, and I commend the finance commission for establishing the committee and uh, the good work that you've been doing, uh, especially in changing the name so it was <laughs> uh, <laughs> more more easily understood by the by the public. So I think you're doing a good job. Uh, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of issues going. But it's, it's, the Climate Committee is very responsive to the times. And I'd also just like to make a comment that I, I remember in the past uh, that there was a science committee. And I remember uh, Bob McIntosh, who was the National Park Service uh, appointee, used to come from Boston. And, and those science committee meetings were coupled with, I think, the P&I uh, or maybe the full commission. I don't recall, but uh, that was that was a um, process that was done, and it worked to have two meetings in in one day. And I attended many many of those two meeting sessions in person oh. uh, back back in the past. But the the, the science committee, you know, kind of came and went, uh, and I missed that a little bit. But I think that 
the the climate committee here is is kind of picking up uh, the gauntlet and and moving in in a scientific direction here for the commission. So, anyways, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Thanks very much. All right, bye bye. All right. Are there uh, any other callers, Paul? No other callers currently. No other callers. All right. Let's let's give them another minute. And let me uh, repeat to uh, Commissioners Lloyd and Prickett, if, if either of you have anything you'd like to throw out there for, uh, you know, go to the order bef before we conclude the meeting, you're, you're welcome to do so now. Sounds like these guys would like to get to adjournment, I think. Okay. All right. Uh, if there being no other callers, I'll close the public comment period. I want to thank uh, the public for, for paying attention and calling in and, you know, giving us great comments and questions. We really appreciate it. And um, so if there is nothing further from the staff or from either of my colleagues on the committee, I guess we could entertain a motion to adjourn. I guess I got to move it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have a second, Ed? Yeah, well... <laughs> Against my, my policy, I will second. Okay. Thank you. All right. It's been great being with you all. I will see you again soon at the December Pinelands Commission meeting. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, all in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned. Take care, everybody. See you again. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody.